are these people? Let's get started, shall we? So, um, so first story tonight, um, Iran finally, and I say this with a heavy heart because we figured it was going to happen at some point. It's just imagine, it's just the idea of when Iran was going to pull the trigger, and they did uh, over within the last few days. So the media is kind of presenting this as, well, Iran has Israel, so now we got to help Israel uh, to retaliate against them. Um, but the argument that Patrick Lawrence uh, from Consortium News is making is that Israel is actually losing, uh, hence the picture of Bibi that yep. so uh, quickly uh, created for this segment. Um, so this kind of started obviously with, um, and I said uh, Iran earlier when we were introducing, but it's actually Lebanon at Hezbollah that has been the issue over the last few weeks. Um, so Patrick Lawrence did an op-ed on Consortium News uh, a few days ago where he writes, Nasala is dead, but Bibi hasn't won. Many people now mourn Nasala's death in Lebanon and elsewhere, but Hezbollah's existence is nowhere near in question. So Patrick continues, you have probably heard by now or heard about Bibi Myanmar, who's viciously um, vituperative vituperative before yeah. the UN General Assembly last Friday. We're going to get into that uh, later on tonight. The Israeli Prime Minister let it be known he hates more than, more or less everyone now, not least the membership of the organization hosting him. They, we, are all anti-Semites, you see. The exceptions are the Americans. Bibi holds Americans in contempt, as he has made clear on numerous occasions, but he cannot afford to hate them because the Americans write the checks and send the 2,000 pound bombs. And now, and I have another message for this assembly and for the world outside this hall. Netanyahu roared toward the end of his 13 minutes at the podium, the transcript of which is here, not even gonna bother because uh, it's full of crap. Um, you can watch it online if you want, but we'll, again, we'll watch part of it tonight. We are winning. And with this came Bibi's now familiar pounding of the left fist. A brief note arrives from Dr. Lawrence. Is it necessary to say you are winning when you are winning, he asks, or does it become necessary to say you are winning when you are not? Yenyahu spoke just as Israeli jets were flying missions over Beirut, where dropping 80 bombs American made and of the 2,000 pound variety, they assassinated Hassan Nasrallah, the respected and beloved by many leader of Hezbollah for the first 32 years. The Times of Israel reported Friday, Netanyahu authorized the operation from his New York lobby hotel shortly before he delivered his exhortations at the United Nations General Assembly. But something else had happened while Bibi bragged that Israel is winning its seven-front war as he calls the terrorist state's aggressions against its neighbors. Moody's, the debt assessing agency, dropped Israel's rate credit rating from A2 to B double A1. This is a cut of two notches, a not unserious downgrade. A-rated debt is considered of high quality and low risk. B-rated debt is ranked medium grade, carries more risk, and may possess speculative characteristics, as Moody puts it. The outlook remains negative, the agency adds. You read all kinds of things in the corporate press about the who won, who lost the consequences of Israel's murder of Nasrallah last Friday. The decisive victory for the Israelis, Hezbollah has been downgraded, Hezbollah has been degraded, Israel has turned the tide in its war along its northern border. All without evidence, evidence that obnoxious phrase the New York Times marshals whenever it wants to cast doubt on something that's more often than not true, but inconveniently so. My favorite in this line comes from Unheard, the online journal published in London. Hassan Nasrallah's death can mark the end of Hezbollah, is the headline atop a piece by one Kyle Orton, who works for the Henry Jackson, Jackson Society. Whoa. 
What happened? I'm repeating. I'm repeating. That's weird. I'm, I'm okay. Repeating. Oh, I know why. Gotcha. I'll fix that. Okay. Um, hold on. Two, one. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. I'll read that sentence again. Uh, Hassan Nasrallah's death could mark the end of Hezbollah. It's a headline atop a piece by one Kyle Orton, who works for the Henry Jackson Society, a nest of paranoid Islamophobes posing as a think tank and also operating in London. Unhinged would be more to the point. I am with Moody's amid all this paper mache triumphalism. The outlook of apartheid Israel is negative in the extreme as it proceeds on this reckless way. As I turn the West Asia crisis, the Zion and state has created this way and that, I cannot think of one damn thing that he suggests they are winning anything. It should be clear by now that it Israelis or anyone else for that matter can kill adversaries but cannot extinguish the movements they lead or the spirit that drives such movements. This is a simple case of understanding or failing to understand fundamental human psychology. Israel, having surrendered their humanity, simply cannot grasp this. Hezbollah was founded in response to the Israeli presence in Lebanon 42 years ago, but it represents, manifests if you like, an identity and an aspiration that extend back many centuries. Many people now mourn Hasala's death in Lebanon and elsewhere, but Hezbollah's existence is nowhere near in question. Alistair Kroc did an interesting interview with Andrew Nepotino last week on the latter program, Judging Freedom. Two of Quirk's points merit attention. One, Nasrallah has obliged all Hezbollah leaders to cultivate their successors with a view to unforeseen disasters such as he that has just befallen him. Can we not be confident Nasrallah followed his own orders? Two, the Israeli airstrikes on Hezbollah rocket and missile installations in southern Lebanon have come near, nowhere near even denting the group's military capabilities. Another point in this line, Nasrallah was a prudent leader, noted for, among other things, revising Hezbollah's manifesto in 2009 in the direction of moderation. Times have changed, and so must we. The argument arises that the organization will now assume or reassume a more radical character. Jonathan Cook uh, appeared to suggest this in a brief piece published on Sunday on X under the headline, In Killing Nasrallah, Israel Chose to Open the Gates of Hell. We will all pay the price. Cook knows West Asia and its people vastly better than I, but I question this judgment. Since the Israelis assassinated Ishmael Hanaje, the Hamas leader in Tehran on the last day of July, we have had a clear and simple demonstration of what the Iranians call strategic patience. I've also seen it mentioned as revolutionary patience, the term I prefer. It means, if I'm not oversimplifying, cultivating one's strengths while maintaining control of a complex dynamic and avoiding responses that stand a good chance of precipitating defeat. My post Nasaha surmise with the Iranians example in mind, Hezbollah's new leaders will not desist in their war against Israel, but they will remain as shrewd as they proved under Nasrallah. They will not lose their heads and resort to the kind of mis or undirected violence the Zionist military is plainly intent on provoking. There is another factor at work here and we must not miss it. To put this very simply indeed, in my judgment, Hezbollah is likely to see things as the Iranians appear to see them. Zionist Israel is destroying itself all on its own. Letting them do so is part of any good strategy. The reality at work in West Asia, this is to say, is that Israel has no alternative course at its disposal that is not self-destructive. The strategies and objectives it has set for itself, notably since the Netanyahu regime brought leaders of Israel fanatical right into government, will inevitably lead to the demise of the Israeli state. No other outcome appears possible so long as Netanyahu allows people such as Itamar ben Gavir and Bezabel Smotrovich, respectively the security and financial ministers, to influence policy to the extent the prime minister has so far let them. Um, Ian Pape had an excellent piece on this question in the June 21st edition of the sidecar feature of the New Left Review. In the collapse of Zionism, the Israeli scholar now in exile, 
argues the Zionist project entered the beginning of its end with Israel's response to the events of last October 7th. While my, one may applaud this progression, Pape does not paint a pretty picture, where he quotes, we're witnessing an historical process, or more accurately, the beginnings of one, that is likely to culminate in the downfall of Zionism. And if my diagnosis is correct, then we're also entering a particularly dangerous conjuncture. For once Israel realizes the magnitude of the crisis, it will unleash ferocious and uninhibited force to try and contain it, as did the South African apartheid regime during its final days. While Jewish identity in Israel has sometimes seemed little more than a subject of theoretical debate between religious and secular factions, Pape writes, it's now become a struggle over the character of the public sphere and the state itself. This is being fought not only with the media, but also in the streets. As has, well been, has, as has been well reported, the corruption of Israel's courts has been one theater in this conflict. As less well reported, but, the, but it, there, if one looks for it, a very considerable proportion of Israelis now applaud on the basis of the most racist interpretations of Zionism, the Israeli Defense Forces unquestionably brutal assaults on Palestinians in Gaza and in the West Bank. Pape seems to think there is no turning back from the grotesqueries, social, political, ideological, and of course military, of post-October 7th Israel. If I read him correctly on this point, I would agree without re a reservation. It seems a matter of time before this ghastly undertaking implodes. Oh, so actually that's the next article, but any thoughts? Um, regarding what Lawrence critique. I mean, it, uh, uh, we've, we've heard this before necessarily when in regards to Israel, right? Where, uh, you know, that they're about to fight a war on three fronts, you know, and they don't really have the resources for that. Well, I would argue, you know, for, I would argue for, right. there's, you know, or probably more, they're fighting now Lebanon, Iran, um and the american people i would argue yeah because for sure you know so it's like having to try and make sense out of at least those three camps well the west you know in general in terms of people like the truth or and basically hating what israel is doing right now so having yeah. to try and make sense of all camps but they're not gaining any support out of it. If anything, they've isolated themselves even more just from provoking what they've wanted in terms of having a regional war in the region in order to justify their actions in terms of what they've done to the Palestinians since really the turn of the century. Yeah. Um, so. Speakers. What was that? Oh. That so, was my um, thing. Okay, so we're going to continue with another article, a uh, friend of the network, uh, Dave DeCamp. We love Dave DeCamp because he writes very short and concise articles. Um, no. So obviously in response to all of this, you know, in terms of, you know, now we're getting into it with Lebanon, uh, especially with the killing of Nasrallah, oh. as expected, uh, Biden and Harris released statements strongly backing Israeli killing of Nasrallah. So Dave writes, on Saturday, both President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris released statements strongly backing the Israeli assassination of Hezbollah Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah, which was carried out using US provided 2000 pound bombs. President Biden said in the statement that Nasrallah's death was a measure of justice for his many victims, including thousands of Americans, Israelis, and Lebanese civilians. The president said the US fully supports Israel's right to defend itself against Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, and any other Iranian-supported genocidal groups. Biden said that he ordered the Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin to send additional military assets to the region. That means people. So, yeah. um, so fam, protect your loved ones if they're in the military because... Yep. Well, and we've we've seen stuff about National Guard being not allowed to like go help out during hurricane relief, and like being on call for the Middle East 
uh, you know, right. is their argument against it, essentially. You know, so... Yeah. So, once our people start dying over there, then I'm sure people will think a little differently in terms... Well, I think people have already gone there, but more people, I think, will definitely think differently in terms of what's happening in Israel. Because Iraq right. is still fresh. Fresh. Minds, especially if you are, are a millennial or even Gen X. Uh, yeah. But I digress. Excuse me. I directed my Secretary of Defense to further enhance the defense posture of the U.S. military forces in the Middle East region to deter aggression and reduce the risk of a broader regional war. He said, yeah, yeah that's not happening, sir. Biden claimed that he seeks de-escalation in the region, yeah, by bombing them with our bombs, okay? But his administration has continued to provide military aid and other types of support for Israel since it began its dramatic escalation in Lebanon. Harris, the 2024 Democratic presidential nominee, released a similar statement saying that Hezbollah's victims have a measure of justice. The vice president said she was having she has an unwavering commitment to the security of Israel. So this is the thing she's saying over and over again. Right. People are justifying to vote for her because Trump is much worse. So allegedly. Allegedly. Well, right. I mean, I've said this even on Twitter. Like, if you're worried about Trump, you should be more worried about BB because Biden, Harris, and Trump are basically sucking his nuts right now. So yeah. Like, if you want a greater evil, evil it's BB. And BB's got a whole Benjamin Netanyahu. So, you know, BB is the one that everybody should be more worried about because basically he has his hold over all, basically all of our government. And yeah. so, uh, I mean, that's just my opinion. But again, I digress. Um, I will always support the is Israel's right to defend itself against Iran and Iran-backed terrorist groups such as Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthis, Harris added. So basically just parroting what Biden said. Yeah. So again, like why people voting for Harris when she's basically said what Biden has said and people were willing to drop Biden at a dime of a hat. Um, yeah. Anyway. Harris also claimed that the administration was working on a diplomatic solution, again, by sending bombs. Okay. Yeah. But the day before Natala was killed, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected a U.S.-backed ceasefire proposal, and Israel said it secured $8.7 billion in new military aid from the U.S. So, fuck what's happening in North Carolina in Ashland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is basically underwater right now and fuck the south for what happened in the hurricane that just passed by you but yeah yep. send more money to israel right now mm -hmm. um, and and it's funny because even online i heard people say you're doing the left wrong because biden has <laughs> given aid um to people who are affected but fufima and all that kind of stuff i'm like well I've seen plenty of TikToks and people on Twitter whose homes are basically fl floating in <laughs> yep. rivers at least a few days ago who obviously think differently right now. So, so yeah, I mean, Think what you want, but the idea, like, we're so willing to send more money out the door, especially at a time like this, and especially, like, within five weeks of the election, I think is just nuts. But, yeah. Um, so, anyway, um, an Israeli official told ABC News that Israel decided to kill Nasrallah because he wouldn't separate the situation at the Israeli Lebanon border from Gaza. Hezbollah had been clear that it would stop its attacks on northern Israel if there was a ceasefire in Gaza. The Israeli airstrikes that killed Nasrallah leveled multiple resident buildings in Beirut. The attack also killed Abbas O. Nifroshan. Nifroshan. Yeah. A senior commander from <clears throat> Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, and Tehran is vowing his death will not go unanswered. 
The killing of Natalah and other Israeli escalations in Lebanon could lead to direct U.S. intervention since the U.S. has vowed it would defend Israel if it faces a large-scale attack from Iran. U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria could also come under attack from local Shia milit militias in response to U.S. support for the killing of Natalah and the slaughtering of civilians in Lebanon. Israeli airstrikes have continued to pound Beirut and other areas of Lebanon. The Lebanese health ministry said at least 33 people were killed and over 190 people were injured by Israeli airstrikes on Saturday. <laughs> on Sunday, the ministry said at least 21 people were killed and 47 were wounded by Israeli attacks on eastern Lebanon's Balek region. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, so basically everything is getting worse, unfortunately, yeah. in the Middle East and... And we're like, yay, he has more money to continue this war in light, uh, in the name of quote unquote diplomacy. If you diplomacy, can, if you can even call it that. Yeah. I just, you know, I just, I, I, I still wonder at one point, like, does it, does any of those countries have enough power to actually push back on it? So. Well, Iran be nice. Well, Iran definitely yeah. does, but I think they've definitely been a little more restrained. Yeah. Which I, I would argue it's more of a media, like they don't want to present themselves as totally like vicious as Israel has been in fear of like yeah. the West basically retaliating, more retaliating and more against them, basically being like, see, you know, they're vicious animals too, whatever, but. Right. Um, so at least with Iran, they've been more cautious in terms of how they're bombing Israel. Yeah. Not to say I agree with that either, but it's basically the idea of like, you've been poking the bear, what do you expect was going to happen at some point? You didn't think that Iran wasn't going to defend it. I mean, you basically killed, um, you know, one of their leaders within their embassy a few months ago. Don't you think we've forgotten that? And now, yeah. you know, like you're essentially killing Hezbollah's leader in Lebanon, of which, you know, is feeling the effects with Iran right now that they are going to strike back against essentially their neighbor in that in that region of the world. So, yeah. So I just don't buy the idea of people justifying the idea that Harris is going to be much better on this issue when it's very obvious by what she's been saying. Like, you can assume that she's not going to stop this in any way, shape, or form, other than kind of be. I would argue, in a way, Biden has been kind of sympathetic too in yeah. certain aspects with the Palestinians, but it's not anything different. Kamala's not proving herself to be any different on this issue than Biden has been. But yet, Again, it's the fear of, oh, Trump will be worse. He will level Gaza. Right. Too late. It's gone. Yeah. It's gone already. Like, infrastructure is just gone. So what are you talking about? He's going to level it. You know, it's, do it's done already. And now under Biden, we're escalating. So, you know, so, uh, yeah. So it's just kind of like the cognitive dissonance that I'm just kind of over. Right. And, you know, I'm just kind of like, you know, as I said, if you have family who's in the military, you know, ha hold on to them close or have them leave because that's where they're going. And once we accumulate deaths, American deaths, in terms of what's happening in that war, I think people will question whoever is going to be in office within the next couple of months, but most certainly Harris, if that's the case. Yeah. And I think people will start maybe regretting ever supporting her but we'll see we'll see um i think i gotta do i gotta do this to bring it back there you go um oh. so well stories like these are the reasons why youtube hates us and no longer monetizes us but you can anyway through kofi so if you go to the link below at the bottom of your screen, or if you scan your QR code, if you have a phone, you can donate to us that way. And when you do, I'm not sure how it's going to work on this, uh, but 
Restream will let us know when you have donated, and we will thank you live. So, yep. so thank you in advance for your support uh, by Kofi, um, and please support us. You know, in terms of helping this channel grow and being able to continue to talk about stories like these. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe, and please share our content in an effort to fight the suppression that we have on YouTube, especially, and make sure we, we leave a comment. We do read those, by the way. So, and sometimes if we like you, we will respond to them. So, um, so yeah, uh, help us get to 3K. We've actually been growing, thanks to you guys, and actually thanks to Eva Bartlett, who we had on a couple weeks ago. Um, Great interview with her. Definitely check those out, uh, interview and the clips that we have put out on that uh, when she was on. Uh, and thank you guys for watching. <laughs>